the, the cognitive turn um, was a uh, was built largely upon uh, a number of people doing, in a sense, some simple-minded experiments, which, which again go back interestingly to, if you recall, in my first lecture, I talked about Frederick Bartlett and his book on remembering. Um, a text that he used was a, a text called War of the Ghosts, uh, which he had people read. It was a fairly extended text. And, and also uh, share their remembrances of it, not just once, but several times. And he talked about, well, based upon their memory of the text, uh, what are we learning about how people make meaning and what happens to, uh, to meaning making over time? Uh, the term that was used to describe uh, this meaning making uh, was constructivism. Um, and constructivism became, in a sense, synonymous with uh, cognition. That when uh, people are reading or dealing with their worlds, they're constructing meaning. Uh, uh, the meaning maker is a composer, uh, very much uh, like a writer. Uh, they are using the resources suggested by the text and in, in conjunction with that, constructing meaning. When Bartlett talked about it, he talked about people using their schema, their, uh, their understandings of the world to suggest meanings that were uh, indicated by the text. And uh, a number of people, in a sense, repeated similar sorts of experiments that really highlighted the extent to which we, the meaning maker readers, like yourself and myself, are constructing meaning. And uh, one of my uh, favorite texts at this time was one uh, that a colleague of mine, Al Collins, in an article Collins, Brown and Larkin uh, used uh, called The Window Text. And uh, let me share this text with you and, and let you uh, experience what the readers in Alan's work experienced en route to the model of meaning making that uh, Alan suggested. I was entitled The Window Text. It was a very short passage. He placed $10 at the window. She tried to give him $5, but he refused to take it. As you can imagine, whenever you're presented with a text, you're involved in, in meaning making, that the text is suggesting uh, different types of meaning. For some people, who read this, I, I know when I read it, I was thinking to myself, okay, he's at a ticket window. He's, he's um, either buying a train ticket or, or, or something or other, maybe a, a theater ticket. The text is not, uh, doesn't really give you that indication. And you know, I might look around the text, uh, glance ahead to see if I can figure it out. But you can sort of see what I'm dealing with here. Okay, what is going on here? He put down $10 at the window, is this person trying to give him change? But why is he refusing to, uh, to take the change? And so you can sort of see how I'm using my schema to come up with a sort of an, uh, 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 a meaning that makes sense from which I can sort of articulate the elements of it. Um, but I'm struggling with it because he refused to take it. I'm using my understanding of exchange to do this. And so you can start to sort of experience or see how these people are able to highlight how one brings their schema to bear or almost like a script to bear on, on that pertains to exchanges. And then Alan, in his study, uh, closed the text uh, with the uh, final line. So when they got inside, she bought a bag of popcorn. Hello, hello. I got the scenario wrong. I, you know, I, I got it partly right. I, I, I had the window, but I, you can sort of see that I was sort of dealing with an exchange between, the, it took about a, a gendered thing. The woman is the person, the receptionist here, the man's making the decision. It was, this is a pretty gender sex anyway. But you can sort of see how 
uh, he was able to demonstrate, one is the overriding influence of background knowledge, but also another key concept which I like, and, and that is you, you're looking to what they call instantiate your schema, instantiate your script or how the meanings fit together. And he talked about it as you're doing it in a progressive refinement fashion. And as you pro proceed through text, uh, you, you, you're dealing with it in these places. In, in, as, you, as, you, as you move through the text, well, if you think about this for a moment, my goodness, this has so many ramifications for how you deal with a reader. Because as you're dealing with a reader, you, 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 you find yourself asking the question, well, how do I uncover the, the meanings that, or the meaning that this person is using at this particular point in time? And if you're looking at a person's reading errors or miscues, as Ken Goodman might sort of say, you're going to have difficulty understanding them unless you've got a sort of a sense of the meaning that that, that student is using at particular points in, in time. It also makes you sort of realize that if a teacher is uh, teaching a lesson, um, he or she, or whether the child's involved in reading, how do you take a step back and, and stop interrogating the kid as if there's a, a single right answer when this child is constructing meaning? And I would sort of say his, those meanings have involved images. They, they might also involve that person positioning themselves from a, a certain perspective. That the child or the person reading it might be aligned with the, the male or the female and maybe sort of looking at it from that perspective. And so you can start to sort of see, wow, uh, meaning making involves something akin to almost different people witnessing an accident and coming from it from different histories and different perspectives and sort of suggesting to teachers, hey, maybe you should sort of realize that what you've got here are multiple meanings in a classroom, which is fertile ground for conversations. And, but your approach might be sort of tied to the fact that you're after uh, right answers to your questions. And that the game of school, unfortunately, in the name of reading comprehension, might be uh, a game which isn't really tied to what we know as meaning making.